Okay, let's get started with the seven deadliest sins of a overheating XJ. Now, I've gone through these seven deadliest sins, and I've categorized those to my liking, and I will tell you my definition and why I put them in the order that I did. But uh, let's go ahead and get to it. Here are the seven deadliest sins of an overheating XJ. Number one is pride. Now, I have designated the water pump to pride. Pride is defined as an excessive love for oneself, or in this case, one's water pump. Beliefs in one's abilities, the desire to excel everything else. The water pump controls all the flow within the cooling system. The pride of the water pump is to excel above the rest of the parts and be responsible for all the proper flow. And we are gonna go through that. Here we uh, have a water pump. Now this is one of the most popular items that in these older Jeeps, you will notice that fell. And a lot of people ignore the water pump. And let me tell you why. This is hooked up along a large number of pulleys and the belt. So when a lot of people are diagnosing, they see that this is moving and they see that everything is fine and they don't think that the pump is bad because this is rotating. And after all, if this is rotating, then the water is pumping fluid and it is doing its job which that's what it's supposed to do. Now, this is a fairly new one. I just uh, bought this about a month and a half ago. Um, but what I wanna go over and what I want you to look for is when this is out and you pull this out. Now, again, when this is installed, this is what it looks like, but you will have a little housing on here and this is gonna be connected to a belt, which in turn will turn and produces the pump water through the system now when people see this they they don't look at this part of it here this is the most important part now on this particular water pump you'll see there is this little plate that is on the outside okay that little plate is not on every water pump that blade that you see inside there which is the propeller that is normal, okay? But this plate doesn't come on every single one. I had another one that I bought brand new. When I pulled it out of the box, there was no plate on here. It was just the pump inside here, the pump propeller exposed. And that is totally fine. There, there is nothing wrong with that. This one will work as well as the other one. When you place this in there, okay, you can see you can see the ridge that we have from here up to here. We don't have a lot of room. And when this is bolted up to the block, there is about a quarter of an inch space for this propeller to do its job and to fling the water within that housing. There's not a lot of room. So again, with that quarter inch, regardless if you have the plate on here or don't have the plate on there, you're distributing the water fine through that block, okay? So I wanted to show you guys this. Um, this is one of the seven deadliest sins of an overheating XJ. And one of the more common problems that we find. Now, why is it a problem? When you look on the other side here, you will see on a lot of cases, this plate is completely dissolved and, and gone. What happens is over time, it gets, it gets worn out and it gets rusted, and then it starts to break and fall apart as does the impeller. So when this fails or the impeller fails and it starts to break down, there's no fluid that is, that is able to transition through the system. Now on this side of it, and this is why a lot of people misdiagnose this, is because they still see that the, that the wheel here is operating and it's functioning perfectly. It looks good, there's no problem. You can feel that there's a little bit of tension on there, there's no problem. But you don't see this side of it and you don't get to dissect it unless you pull this off and realize that, oh my gosh, every single one of my fins, which are these here, are completely gone and this plate is completely deteriorated or the fins are completely deteriorated. This is a very common problem in the XJs and this is a very overlooked piece of the heating system. So make sure you're paying attention to this one. It is a little bit of work to pull it out, but nothing that won't take you about probably an hour. 
let's go ahead and get to the next item. Number two is lust. I have designated the thermostat housing to lust. Lust refers to an intense desire, usually to engage in illegal or immoral pleasure, or in this case, the thermostat housing's relationship to the thermostat. The lust between these two products go hand in hand. However, the thermostat housing relies on the thermostat to be able to provide the flow necessary for the two parts to work together. And as you can see here, we have two different types of thermostat housings. Housing. A lot of people don't know that there is a standard T-STAT housing and that there is a high flow T-STAT housing. Now this here is a standard T-STAT housing. This is my old one that uh, was in the Jeep when I purchased it. And this is a high flow T-STAT housing. And I purchased this one um, about a month ago. I installed it and I'm very, very pleased with it. This is a crown uh, T-STAT housing, which runs about $40 for just this here. And then you also get a gasket. Now, on these T-STAT housings, you have your upper radiator hose connection right here. And then you have your heater core connection here. And then on this threaded joint right here, this is where your T-STAT your sensor goes. And when you flip this over, your T-STAT will sit inside there. Now, when this is inside the Jeep, it actually it actually looks like looks like this once it's installed in in, in the Jeep. So, uh, let's kind of go through this, and I'll show you what the difference is and why I would highly recommend the uh, high flow. Now, if you notice inside here, you can you can see the concave here within this housing. You can see how uh, this is bored out and kind of rounded out right there. Now I'm gonna show you the difference with this one here is that you can see that there is quite a bit more that is bored out and comes down a lot lower. Now, looking at this here, you look at the actual flow chamber right there. And I mean, it's a good size. If you haven't uh, had a chance to look at a high flow and compare it, you probably would never know the difference. But a side by side, you can see how much more flow you get in the high flow that is very, um, very much larger, uh, quite a bit larger than your standard. And, you know, there's just, just a little bit less restriction inside there. Uh, the direction and the flow of it, uh, as, as it would be fluid, I think this one here would be much more fluid and fluent than the other one. But you can clearly see that there is a much um, bigger hole that is bored in there, and you can clearly see why this allows a high flow system, um, and why this is important because you know these these Jeeps are infamous for wanting to overheat. Um, so you can even see the, the light at the end of the tunnel in this one. This one here, you can't see nothing. I mean, it's just it's pretty crazy. But there is there is the actual hole. You, you can see inside there, there's nothing restricting anything inside there. There's nothing that's, that's blocking these. It's just that this high flow creates so much more space inside there and gives, gives much more flow through the radiator, through the upper hose. So there is your side-by-sides with this being standard and this one being your high flow. Number three is greed. I have designated the fan clutch to greed. Also known as avarice, covetousness, or cupidity, greed is an intense desire and passionate love for material wealth. The fan clutch not only takes on the job of the clutch, but it also is responsible for the material of the fan and the amount of air it distributes. Sometimes when the fan clutch doesn't work properly, it greedily robs the engine of the air it needs. Basically, the fan clutch is responsible for all the material and the well-being of the engine. So let's take a look at these fan clutches. Now, here. I do have two fan clutches here. I wanted to go over this because I felt like it was important. And there are some recommendations for these fan clutches. I, however, go with the OEM size fan clutch which is this one here. This is the 2625 Murray. This is the standard fan clutch. I do go in more depth and detail about the fan clutches and what to look for and the installation in one of my other videos. 
but this here is more of a comparison and to show you what we are doing and kind of give you an idea of what each one of these do. Now this one here is a ZJ fan clutch and part number 2736. And by the way, you can get both of these at your AutoZone or your O'Reilly or your local auto parts. There's nothing really special about these. Uh, a couple of different adapters, as you can see here. This here has a flange adapter. This one here has a threaded adapter. Now, let's go through a little bit on the, the differences. This is a ZJ fan clutch. And a lot of people like to upgrade their fan clutch to the ZJ. You can tell that it is much bigger it's a it's a lot bigger than than the xj fan clutch just kind of show you a top view no that doesn't do a lot of justice does it let's do this there you can see the difference now with the zj it is a lot bigger and you are going to get more airflow here's the problem with the xj fan clutch if you put in a bigger radiator, you're not gonna have as much room. This fan clutch is a lot deeper, and when you put the blades on, will come closer to the radiator, and you'll possibly ruin all the fins if you don't really pay attention to the fan clutch when you're installing this larger one. Okay, that is one of the biggest problems with installing the bigger fan clutch, is that you are limited on your room when it comes to the distance from the, the fan blade and the radiator. Again, it does create a lot more air, but you are very restricted with your room. The other th issue that you're gonna come across with the ZJ fan clutch is if you install this, it is a lot louder. So it's gonna sound like a turbine jet coming underneath that hood. Uh, they do blow a lot of air. It is a great upgrade. I, I don't have anything bad to say about it. Um, in my video, I personally went with the XJ, the standard fan clutch, and I don't have any problems. This thing has worked out really good. I don't have any restrictions. You can see the little tabs that are on the edge there. When the fan is mounted on, I have plenty of clearance with my Mishimoto radiator which is a larger radiator i don't have any problems now i did put this one underneath there and i was limited i have about i would say three quarters to a quarter of an or three quarters to a full inch clearance from the furthest outside blade to the radiator with this one here with the blade on i only had maybe a quarter of an inch so it was just a little bit out of my comfort zone so i decided to just stay with the standard oem size so this is the fan clutch assembly. This is the ZJ and this is the XJ. And again, there are your part numbers. Number four is sloth. I decided to designate the lower radiator hose because I do feel like it is the laziest part of the cooling system. Sloth or acedia is laziness as is manifested by the willful avoidance of work. Rather, it stems from the desire to avoid responsibility. One adage that aptly captures the sin of sloth is, those who do not work should not eat. This is the case with the lower radiator hose. The water pump puts all the work on its shoulders for the lower radiator hose. If the pump produces too much pressure, the lower radiator hose simply collapses. The only job for this lazy part or the lower radiator hose is to remain a full tube and to keep its structure. Now keep in mind, this tube that I have does not have the spring in it, and this to me is the epitome of a lazy tube or sloth. So let's go ahead and take a look at this. Now the lower radiator hose is a very important part of your cooling system. And the reason why this is one of the seven deadliest causes of an XJ overheat is that if you do not have the lower radiator hose with the spring in it, you have a high risk of it collapsing. Now this is a tube that will collapse. This does not have a spring in it. The one that you want in your XJs is the lower radiator hose with the spring. Now what that spring does is it prevents this hose from collapsing under pressure. And what will happen is, is when your system is cooling and it gets really hot and you're at high speeds, the engine produces higher RPMs. 
Those RPMs cause your water pump to suck harder and causes a lot more pressure in the system. So when you see this crease right here, this crease, when it starts to, when it starts to create a lot of pressure, it kinks just like that. When it's got a lot of pressure under there and it gets really hot, what that does, as you all may know, is it restricts the flow. There in turn causes you to overheat. So they produce a hose that has a spring in it. And that spring goes from here over this bend through this curve right here. So when you do get that pressure, that pressure builds up, it cannot, it cannot kink like that. That spring causes it to stay and maintain its pressure. This is one of the other common reasons why your XJ will overheat. So when you pull this tube off, you can physically see inside here, you will see the spring inside this tube. Now this one here, obviously you don't see the spring because this is not the spring actuated tube. I do have a spring actuated tube. Unfortunately, I didn't pull it out and give you guys the comparable so you could see it. But um, it's pretty simple and pretty self-explanatory. If you can do this to your hose, you know you don't have the spring inside there. All right. So yes, wanted to make sure that we cover this. This is one of the seven deadliest uh, sins of overheating a Jeep XJ is the lower radiator hose. Real easy to install, real easy to replace. It's just two clamps on each end. And this one goes to the top of the, uh, I'm sorry, to the lower um, port to the radiator. And this one goes to the block. So very simple to replace, but very detrimental to your heating system if you do not have the proper hose in there. And these hoses here, this one here without the spring is probably about $20. The one with the spring is $32.99 and you can get them at Napa Auto Parts. Um, I think O'Reilly and AutoZone, those guys don't typically carry them because it is an OEM part. Mopar carries, carries them, but man, you're gonna be paying a pretty buck for those. So. Anyway, there is another part that you need to take notice of and a very good section to be able to troubleshoot and find out if this is your problem. So let's go ahead and go on to the next item that we're going to cover. Number five is wrath. And what better part to designate wrath than the radiator cap? Wrath is simply uncontrolled feelings of anger, rage, or hatred. Wrath feeds on a strong desire to exact vengeance and is often fueled by an irrational drive to harm others. This is exactly the scenario with the radiator cap. The cap is required to withhold pressure and stress of the system. If it doesn't, it releases a hot tempered steam and rage of fluid through the cap or in most cases, the overflow tank. If you're not careful, the wrath of that radiator cap can burn you immensely. So let's go ahead and take a look at this Mishimoto radiator cap that I have here. Probably one of the most overlooked symptoms of an overheating system. A lot of people do not take into consideration that the cap could possibly be the reason you are overheating. The reason for that is, is the cap is not holding its pressure. When you look on the back side of this here, this cap is made to hold pressure. Now the pressure on, on your system for Jeep XJs, uh, I, I, it varies. It's from six to 16 PSI, but on our Jeep XJs, it's typically anywhere from 12 to 16 PSI. You wanna make sure that you check the radiator cap and make sure that it is holding pressure. A lot of your local auto parts have, have products that they can rent you or even loan out to check and see if your radiator cap is holding pressure. If you don't have that capability, one of the things that you can look at is if your overflow is filling up. And that means the expansion tank is filling up with fluid because the pressure is, is building up and the cap is not holding the pressure, so it's going to the expansion tank. Um, another scenario could be that one of the radiator hoses is blowing and it's leaking uh, fluid antifreeze from the hoses. Uh, that's another symptom that you can look for. Also, overheating is, is a symptom as well, but 
Anyway, just make sure that you look at the, the radiator cap, make sure that it's holding its pressure. Be very, very careful that if you do overheat, you're not just taking this off. You've got to let your system cool down because if this is holding its pressure and you do try to turn it, uh, twist it off, that, that uh, super scalding antifreeze and coolant is going to spray and it's going to get all, the, all over your face and it's going to burn you and that is not going to be a good day. So make sure that you are observing the radiator cap when you're diagnosing an overheating problem for the XJ. Number six is Envy. And what better part to designate to Envy other than the T-Stat or the thermostat? Envy is the desire for possessions, happiness, as well as the talents and abilities of others or parts. According to the thermostat, the other parts don't deserve the wealth, talents, or status that they possess. So is the thermostat. The thermostat is one of the most popular parts of failure. The thermostat has a simple job yet wants to control the job of the other parts. A stubborn thermostat that won't open properly takes away the job of the other's working parts. If the thermostat doesn't open, it doesn't allow proper water flow or proper temperature measures. A thermostat can really be frustrating. Let's go ahead and take a look at these thermostats that I have laid out here and go through this. T-stats are very common for felling and probably one of the very first things that you're going to troubleshoot to make sure if, you're, if your system's overheating, this is going to be the, the least expensive and probably the easiest to get to to troubleshoot your system if it's overheating. Now I have three of them here. I've got one in its package and then I've got these other two that are over here. And a couple of things that I want to point out. This is a brand new Summit Racing top of the line thermostat that is at 180. Um, this is for GM, Ford, and AMCs and V8s. Now, top of the line Summit Racing equipment. One thing that I don't like about this is there is no air vent on this T-stat. Okay, if we take a look at this one over here, this one didn't come with an air vent, but I actually drilled it in. You can see the hole right there. I drilled in an eighth inch hole for the air vent. That is a Stanton T-Stat. And then our next one over here, this is a Mishimoto T-Stat. And as you can see, it comes with an air vent in it. Now this is a 195. You can see the temperature ratings right there on the housing. This one is a 180 and this one is a 180. So I kind of wanted to just show you the differences uh, where this one you have no air vent. This one was drilled with an air vent. This one comes with an air vent. You may be asking yourself, well, why is an air vent important? One of the main reasons why you wanna have an air vent in your T-Stat is if you for some reason do not air out your system properly when you are flushing your system and then refilling it, this air vent is crucial for allowing air bubbles to bypass it and to alleviate that air in your system. Now it will be little at a time and it may take it some time, but it will eventually eliminate the air that is in your system. That is the importance of this air vent. The other thing that is important is when you buy one that has the air vent on the top, you automatically know that that goes to the 12 o'clock hour and that goes to the very top towards the um, hood of the car or the top of the engine, because there is a top and a bottom. So that's the nice thing here. This one here, you drill the hole in there and then you always put it in at the 12 o'clock hour. Um, and when these show up like this, you know, you, I mean, you can't really put them upside down, but you want to make sure that if you had to take it out and put it back in, you want to put it back in, in the same direction. So that's kind of the differences between the two or well, between these three right here. Um, highly recommend the Mishimoto with the air vent. This is a little bit more expensive. It does run $34.99 for that. Um, go into the Stanton if you drill your own hole, which is no problem. Again, I would use an eighth inch drill bit and drill that in. That is a 999 T-Stat. And then your Summit Racing 180 degree T-Stat here. This one here is $14.99. Now, the other thing about T-Stats is you have, you'll notice I've got a 180 here and I also have a 195. 
you do have two different temperatures. There is a, a lot of confusion and a lot of talk out there for which one is better and what does a 180 do versus a 195. Either one is actually going to work just fine. However, a 195, when you've got that in your system, you know, in, in these Jeeps and these XJs, the, the middle number is 210 degrees. So if you've got a 195, that means that this opens up at 195 degrees and it only gives a 15 degree differential, you're gonna be at the 210. Now, what does that also mean is that it does take the engine longer to heat up and to open up. And for that reason, you're going to, you're going to have higher heat on your controls than you would if you had a 180. If you have a 180 degree T-stat and we are giving a 15 degree differential, this will open up at 180. And then if you reach 210, you're 30 degrees over. So you're still, you've, you've got a little bit of a, a heat issue, but it's still normal to sit at 210, nothing above that. Cause at that point you're looking at 30 degrees and it's a little questionable, but you know, you're, you're still okay. I think the magic number is 210. Anything over that you want to you wanna kind of pay attention to. All right. Now, the next step, what we're going to do is, is I'm going to take you guys inside and we're going to boil these in hot water. The reason why you want to boil these, and I would, I would highly recommend that you do this with your brand new ones. We all think that we buy a brand new T-Stat and it's going to work perfectly. Well, let me tell you what. I've bought a brand new T-Stat. Not to point out any one specific, but when I bought it, I installed it and it did not work. It failed to open. So from that lesson, I have learned that when I buy a brand new T-Stat, I'm going to put it in boiling water no matter what. Boiling water does this. It gets it past the 180 or the 195 degree temperature. When you reach that temperature, you will notice that this will start opening up. That, that spring and that valve will open fully, allowing water to distribute through there and into your system. On a failed one, as is this one, that will never open. That there will reach the hottest temperature possible and it will never open. You won't see it. So what we're gonna do is I'm gonna take you guys inside and we are going to boil all three of these. I'm going to show you it boiling, I'm gonna show you how it opens and I'm gonna show you the failed one then it, uh, that it doesn't open up. So let's go ahead, go inside and let's take a look at this. Okay, we've had both of these T-stats in. The 180 has been in for about six minutes. There is, I'm gonna grab this a little differently. There is our 180, still failed never open now the 195 has been in here for about three minutes and there you go you can see that it is open that is a properly functioning t-step when that opens it allows all the fluid to go through the system so we know that this t-stat is is a good t-stat we'll go ahead and put that back in and i am happy with those results Last but certainly not least is gluttony. I have designated the radiator to gluttony and I don't think that there is any better part to this cooling system to uh, designate to gluttony. Gluttony refers to the overconsumption of food or anything to the point of waste. Gluttony is considered as the overindulgence in food when you should spare some for the needy or in this case, the radiator. The radiator can consume a lot of material and build up within the radiator, in turn restricting flow for all the other crucial components. The radiator simply consumes the most junk or waste within the fins and the tubes of the radiator and really starves the rest of the, the system. Now, I haven't really gone through and shown you how to, uh, how to flush this radiator in this video. I did it in my other video, but let's go ahead and take a look at the overview of my. Here we have a Mishimoto all aluminum radiator. Now this one here had a whole bunch of gunk inside it, a bunch of um, just buildup and particles, a lot of oil that had created uh, some buildup within the coils on the inside. And what we're gonna do is, is we're gonna show you the differences between what to flush it with and how it's being flushed. 
and let you see the end result. So now what I wanted to do when I very first started this is I, I wanted to know what the best possible product was going to be to eat away and to dissolve all of the oil and the buildup that was inside this radiator. Um, when you overheat in these uh, radiators, a lot of the times it will cause carbon buildup within the fins and the tubes that are on the inside of this radiator. And I'll show you really quick what we are talking about. Up inside here, you can see that is a clean tube. But if you go up to the other side right there, you can see some of that buildup that is on that pipe right there. That is from all of the carbon burn and the oil. Now that's what we wanna get off because as these systems get hot, they build up heat, it actually starts to stick to the fins and the coils within these radiators. So in my investigation, and hopefully this helps you guys out as well to help you decide what you want to do, um, I did a little test and I have this all set up right here. Okay, and the first test that I did was I went out and I bought this bl uh, Blue Devil radiator flush, and you'll see two of them here. There's the complete radiator flush and oil degreaser. Now that's a three in one, and that has the radiator flush, the oil degreaser, and the rust removal in it. Might have been a little bit overkill for what I was doing here, but I decided to put the whole court inside the radiator and I flushed it out the best that I could. Come to find out it wasn't doing the trick. It broke it up a little bit, but I wasn't too happy with the full result. So what I did next was I went out and I bought the radiator flush. Now this here, if, if you're flushing your radiator and don't have any problems, I would recommend it. This is more for a high mileage, but I wanted to combine the two just to see what I would get and to put more fluid inside the radiator when I am flushing it out. So uh, after doing that, um, it broke it up just a little bit, but it just wasn't exactly what I was looking for and didn't clean it out the best that I could. So my next step that I decided to do was, is I was gonna go and get some acetone. And yes, I put this acetone directly into the radiator. Now I filled the radiator up with acetone and that is one gallon, okay? I let it sit for 24 hours when I did this and I'm gonna show you the results of what I got. This is one hour, or I'm sorry, this is one day of letting it sit inside the radiator. One thing that I noticed is you can see that I was able to get a couple of bigger chunks out of this here. And then I got a bunch of the little debris and everything. I was happy with it, but it just wasn't picking up enough that I felt like the system was fully cleaned out. So I wanted to go ahead and try something else. So my next step, I cleared out the radiator. My next step was to use vinegar. Now I use distilled vinegar, uh, just so we don't have any of those unwanted minerals and particles inside there. So I filled this up. Again, that is one gallon of distilled vinegar and I let it sit for 24 hours. And here is the result that I got from my vinegar. Now I was really happy with this. Um, as you can see inside here, not very many big particles, um, but I may have got a majority of those out. What I was happy with was the fact that it was dissolving the grease and the oil that was inside there. And as you can see, I got quite a bit of residue out of there and I was pretty happy with it. So then I wanted to do one more cycle and I wanted to make sure that this was very clean. And what I did was, is I went out and I got some Dawn dish soap and some H2O. And I squoze the dish soap directly into the radiator in the upper spout and the lower spout. And then I filled the rest with a gallon of water. I let this sit and I, I used really hot water. So I let this sit for three hours. And what I did was, is when I had it inside there, I would, sh I would shift the radiator back and forth like this to get the water to move. Okay, so after three hours of doing this, this is what I was able to get out. You can see very, very little, um, 
but I did get a little bit. Now Dawn is really good about breaking up grease. Um, it's one of the mechanic secrets about washing the hands and getting all the grease off your hands and does a really good job. So I wanted to give this a shot and just use this inside the radiator as my final cycle. And I can't say that uh, I, I'm not happy with it. This is a pretty good result. Um, the bottom of this one here is, it looks a lot darker than it is because it's sitting on the ground, but there wasn't hardly any debris or grease that came out of there. So after I did that, I went ahead and used my garden hose with really hot water and I flushed out my radiator until all of the suds and the bubbles were out. Now this took me about 10 minutes of just flushing it out with super hot water and the garden hose. And when doing that, I was able to get everything out of the radiator. I had no debris come out, there was no grease, and I feel like we did a really good job with that. So that's kind of the breakdown on chemicals and how to flush the system out with the different variations. Again, using water and Dawn dish soap, using vinegar, distilled vinegar, using acetone, and using the Blue Devil radiator flush for this system. And as you can see, there it all is put together. Do is I just wanna kinda of go over some of the parts of this radiator so you understand where it's at. Um, I obviously have the cap off on this one here, but this is, this is where the cap goes. You put that down there and just clamp that on. This here is your overflow. Uh, you'll connect the overflow hose. That runs to your expansion tank, which will go to the left side or the passenger side of your vehicle. And then on this side over here, this is where your upper radiator hose is connected. As you come down over onto the side over here, this, and it's hard to see when these are mounted in your Jeep, but this here is the drain cap. Now, one of the things that's very important about these drain caps is if you can access it, when you thread this out, if you have any debris inside your radiator and you've got buildup inside your radiator, when you pull this cap off, this cap will come off and you will notice so much gunk and junk on there and black stuff on the end of this probe. This acts as almost like a magnet when it, is, when it is inside there. So you want this to be super clean like this. But this is obviously a lower drain hose and you, or drain fitting and you can drain it out that way. But odds are you're going to see a whole bunch of gunk on the end of that. So take note of that. And then on, let me get this threaded in here so I don't have it loose. Okay, easier said than done. Okay, and then as we go over to this side, there is where your lower hose connection is. This is that lower hose that we were talking about that connects to the block. And then you have a transmission fitting here that goes to the transmission for the coolant as well. And that pretty much just wraps up what the radiator is and what it consists of. Um, you can see some of the fins right there are a little bit uh, bent over. You want to try to keep your fins like this as much as possible where they're nice and clean. Um, I'll go through and bend some of those back and uh, make sure that we have a, a good looking radiator. But. This wraps up the seven deadliest sins of a overheating XJ. Thank you guys for watching. Don't forget to subscribe. If you have any comments, please post them in the comment section.